Hi guys, I'm Ruby, and today I'm going to talk about Diane Spumo's Virginiana, which is the persimmon tree. Um, I'm a junior at the college studying neuroscience, and the persimmon tree, um, it's one of two species in America, um, two species of persimmon in America, and this is actually called the white persimmon, sometimes called the common persimmon, possum wood, white ebony, sugar plum, um, and for the First Nations people, they call it the Puchinian, Passimian, and Pesansinian or the choke fruit, which is a um, reference to the number of seeds it has, because it has a lot of seeds. Um, and it's mostly found in the southeast of America, so um, these two outlying California and Utah is because of the two little orchards that have started to cultivate it, but mostly it's found in the wild in the southeast, and it's like usually found on the roadsides, and like you drive by and people usually don't pay attention to this plant. So today I'm gonna argue that this plant is, uh, has many historical and cultural ties to the United States, and we have overlooked its importance to our predecessors as a food and a medicine, and it should be added to the menu along with um, our turkey and our pumpkin and all those um, famous Thanksgiving vegetables and fruits and meats just because of its historical ties. And this is a pie that you can make with persimmon. Like, you can make a lot of really cool food that I'll go into later on. So, uh, um, it's a tree, um, it comes in a tree, usually about 50 to 65 feet tall, and um, has a short trunk with large branches that spread out pretty far, um, and it has these distinctive square, um, square bark, scale-like bark, and that's how you can figure out if it's a persimmon tree or not when there's no fruit on it. Um, it also has oblong leaves, which is kind of distinctive in that um, it, like the trees that usually go around it don't have the sim similar, like, shapes and it just looks really different um, but people don't pay attention to it so it's like the hidden gem anyway um it has flowers it's a dioecious species so both male and female plants have flowers but in the female plants they have these white flowers that bloom in the spring and they become these yellow green um, fruits early in the spring and then um yeah and then they become sorry they become uh over the summer, they start becoming green, and then later in the fall, they'll start turning orange, and this deep, ugly orange. And when it's this deep, ugly orange, it's ripe, and it's ready to be harvested. And that's early in the winter, usually after a frost, which is interesting, because most people um, harvest before the first frost, and this one does better after a first frost. Okay, so the Native Americans, um, the story behind persimmon has gone, like, for a really long time, and one of the cool stories that I came across was the one related to um, raccoons. And raccoons actually, um, there's like a nice poem that talks about how the great spirit asked um, a, uh, a man to um, go on a spiritual journey, and during a spiritual journey he wasn't allowed to eat. But while he was on a spiritual journey, he saw these persimmon trees and he ate the persimmons. And the great spirit came down, he was really angry, and he was like, well, you didn't listen to me, you didn't finish your, um, your journey, and so I'm returning to a, a raccoon. And so if you notice, raccoons have paw prints that are really human-like, and they have really hands that are human-like. And according to this legend, that's why raccoons know exactly the day when the first frost will come, and they'll find the persimmons ripe the first day, and they'll like get to it before humans do. So <laughs> that's the lore behind, um, one of the stories behind the persimmon plant, which is fun. Um, so the persimmons, was used for um, fruit. The fruit was uh, can be eaten just raw. It can also be preserved, uh, dried in the sun, or like canned and jarred. Um, the Native Americans um, incorporated into breads, gruels, soups, stews, cornbread, pudding, beer, and tea. And so it's one of the like major sweeteners. They didn't really have like sugar cane or anything. So that was like sugar for them. Um, and it was also used topically, the ripe fruit was used topically for um, to tighten your tissue when you get like burns or like little cuts. And it was also used to treat um, gastrointestinal bleeding um, and fungal effects in the, in the mouth to like thrush. And they had a disease called Ohalagihovaskse and they used it um, like a mouthwash made of persimmon, um, which is really important. They were also the people, first people to document the fact that the, um, the roots the, and the bark had higher amounts of medicinal use than the younger twigs. And so they were like, they were aware that different parts of the plant had different uses. So then we talk about the Westerners. So when, um, when Westerners came to colonize America, um, you guys probably recognize John Smith. 
Um, he was one of the first people to incorporate it into the colonist diet. They were in Jamestown, and it was in the middle of winter, and there was no food. Um, mm -hmm. But um, the persimmon tree had just like ripened; they just had their first frost, and so he saw these Native Americans like um, incorporate into their diet. He decided to like tell the colonists to start eating these fruit, and they called it. Um, well, at first they were eating the non-ripe fruit, and um, they got sick a lot because it was really extremely astringent. But then um, he learned that you can you have to wait for the first frost, which is interesting. Um, the wood is used commonly in like crossbows. It's also really a famous golf club um, material in America today. So it's the tree still grown like white ebony um, uh, golf clubs. Those are persimmon wood. Um, it's also used for drumsticks. Um, you'll see a lot of carving tools. They'll I mean, it's a really good wood for carving. It's a soft wood, but it's also really sturdy. Um, uh, oh, and the seeds were used um, as a coffee substitute during the Civil War. So during the Civil War, the Confederate soldiers were pretty much blocked in. The Gulf was blocked by the Union soldiers. And so without coffee, a lot of the soldiers just took these seeds, roasted it with, um, with sweet yams, um, and they made that to their coffee drink in the morning. So sustain them. So it's an important plant for our um, Civil War too. Um, and the, the fruit was also used to make vinegars and alcohol and, um, and it was started um, incorporated into the, the diet much like Native Americans did. So allopathic and cancerous, um, cancerous. So um, it's mostly used for um, ingested, so there's a lot of different concoctions that can be ingested for different situations. Um, gastrointestinal bleeding and thrush, um, well, those are like ingested, but for thrush, it, they made like a mouthwash. For antiseptics, it was a topical use, so they'll take the fruit or the bark or um, the bark in water concoctions and they'll apply it topically. For uterine hemistering, um, there's also like drinks. Um, it was also used for diarrhea, dysentery, dropsy, syphilis, um, the feria and also for gonorrhea. So all those, um, a lot of the like STIs were um, like these concoctions that back in the day, no one, like if you had an STI, you're stuck with it for life. And so this actually offered some relief. And um, these people were drinking gallons and gallons of water. So it was like, I think it was like 10 gallons of this concoction a day. And so they were severely hydrated with um, persimmon bark water, which is helpful. Um, currently, um, you can find persimmon hand moisturizers and face creams that will tighten and rejuvenate your pores. And um, you can also um, buy the fruit and you can eat it for diarrhea or constipation. Um, the, uh, the ripe one or the not ripe one, depending on how well you're feeling. And it's also used for um, a, as a diuretic and constipation for its high um, potassium. So um, the major constituents, it has a lot of tannins. So these top three are the tannins. Um, Canadin and galactofen are really um, important antioxidant, um, has any important antioxidant properties. The tulic acid is also really important for um, like antipyretic and um, like mosquito, oh, malaria, that's what it is, anti-malarial properties. And, um, and it also has a lot of uh, vitamins and natural minerals, which come, um, which actually makes it a really good food to have, like just a dietary supplement to have in your diet and really square off your, the meals. So, we, um, so that has shown to decrease um, mosquito growth, mosquito larvae growth. So um, these are three trees, the American elm, the maple, and the red oak, and you see the persimmon tree. So these are, uh, this is done in the lab, and they took a bunch of leaves, and they grew lar uh, mosquito larvae in it. And if you notice, the persimmon, um, the larvae don't really thrive, and so it has a kind of like anti-mosquito, not anti-malarial, but anti-mosquito effect, which is really interesting. And so when they looked into it, they noticed that this naphthoquinone, 7-methyljugulone, was probably most likely an active ingredient. 7-methyljugulone um, was originally um, isolated from a plant that's um, like a cousin of the elm. I mean, it's called uh, ebony, black ebony. And so it's from the same family, but it's actually a different tree. And so most of the experiments that have been done are with the Strax family different tree, but it's also found uh, really highly in the persimmon tree. Oh, and those have shown to be um, anti-termidal. -term 
And the tree actually is very antifungal, antiintermital. Like it doesn't need a lot of pesticides, and it can just survive on its own, which is really cool. Um, so the clinical studies that they have done on rats, so they took some of these um, tannin fractions and they injected them subcutaneously, and they actually caused cancer into these rats, and so they're really good for causing cancer. But then the naphthoquinones that I talked about earlier um, have been shown to re reverse disease progression with like antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, and anti-insecticidal -ins activities. Um, and these are all done in a lab in like petri dish, so no um, animal studies yet. Um, Contraindications with using this plant um, is it's a little risky with people with hypotension with low blood pressure because um, it has a really high potassium content so it will draw more water out of your bloodstream and so it'll even lower your blood pressure more. Conversely, it will probably help, be helpful if you have hypertension. Um, and it's bad for diabetes um, if you're not really good at controlling your sugar because it has a really high sugar content. It's full of, it's like it's used as a sweetener a lot of times. So if you, you can go hyperglycemic if you eat too much sugar. Cement. Also, if you eat a lot, there's this one case with a 40-year-old man who ate um, persimmons without peeling it for um, like his entire life, and he had a phytobiazar, but phytobiazars are usually found in large grazing animals like horses and cows, and so if they eat too much of the, um, too much of these persimmons right when they like fall onto the ground, um, they get these nice biazars, which are like balls of like balls of vegetation that are stuck in their stomach and then basically it causes gastrointestinal blockage and then they die. So um, you shouldn't eat a lot of it, like, but like you could eat like 10 a day and be fine. This person was eating, I think he was eating persimmons like like a bushel a week and he was eating it for his entire <laughs> life and he got a phytobiazar. So um, it's relatively safe to eat usually. Um, except for if you go obsessive with it. Um, and um, you should keep your grazing animals away from it. Um, so I hope I've made a good argument for how important it is as a historical and uh, um, historical and culturally tied plant to the, to the United States. Um, it's a food, it can be used as food, and I think it should be cultivated more often in the United States besides just those two little orchards in Utah and California. Um, it has a lot of organic materials that are um, really used a lot in industry. However, all the plants that, like all the golf clubs and stuff, they go out hunting for these trees in the wild. So um, for a tree that's not really recognized like by a lot of people, if you're going out to hunt it, it's gonna go away really soon <laughs> if you don't cultivate it. Um, and it has many med medicinal applications and it has a, um, a much higher 7 methyl jugulum content than the, the tree that it was isolated originally isolated in. So if they find a medicinal use for that, um, they would probably want to extract it from this tree um, just because it has a higher content of it. Um, and we should learn to cultivate it properly. Um, it takes about 10 years for the, fruit to, uh, the trees to bear fruit. Probably one of the reasons why we don't like to grow it because for the first 10 years you don't really get any money from the trees and the fruit. But um, if it's cultivated, um, for a while and like passed down, it'll uh, prove to be a very useful plant. Okay, I think that's it.